My Perestroika is a documentary film airing on PBS in the POV series. And with me is Robin Hessman, the director of the film. Hi, Robin. Hi. Thanks for joining me. Thanks. So, uh, My, My Perestroika is, follows five Russians who are about our age. Mm -hmm. um, Russians who began in school in the communist USSR, Soviet Union, and, and now are adults in a democratic, free market culture. Th this generation in particular completely straddles the old world and the new world because their childhoods were basically completely typical Soviet childhoods and then they were teenagers and coming of age just when Gorbachev came to power and they graduated from college the year that the USSR collapsed which was 1991, 20 years ago exactly. So they had a childhood completely in one world, their sort of transition period as the country was going through all of those very fast changes and then they started adulthood in this brand new country. Uh, of course it's an amazing subject and it's great that you were able to put it together in a film but tell us how what it means to you because you have some personal history with uh, Russia. Yes, uh, I'm not Russian. I don't have even any family background going generations back. N nobody was from there, but I was always curious about Russia, about the Soviet Union as a kid. I think in part because of the Cold War and the idea that this was this big bad evil empire that wanted to destroy the planet with nuclear weapons and I wanted to know more about it. I think even on some level I was skeptical as a child that an entire country could only be full of mean and evil people. So I started to read about Russia. I read Russian literature. I read Russian history. Uh, I subscribed to Soviet Life magazine when I was 10 to my parents' utter horror. It was uh, a magazine put out by the Soviet Foreign Ministry in English and was, you know, pretty much an advertisement for how great the USSR was. Uh, and I can't say that the articles were that fascinating for a 10-year-old, but the photographs were incredible, especially the photographs of kids. Mm. So eventually I wound up going there uh, for the first time when I was 18 and I wound up living there from 1991 to 1999. Uh, I went to film school there, I produced Russian Sesame Street for the Children's Television Workshop and made some short documentaries and it really became the place where I lived all of my early adult years and an important part of my life as well. So going from learning about uh, the USSR as a child and, and living in that transitionary time, what, what was your takeaway? I think uh, my one of my takeaways was how hard it is to explain and how hard it is to sum up. When I came back to the States at the end of 99, uh, I got the feeling that, that my friends would really love me to tell them one or two sentences that then they could carry with them as what to think about Russia or what the experience had been for me or what Russians think now about you know, their country. And this kind of enormous political, historical, sociological change is incredibly complicated, not just for the entire country and for a generation, but also for every individual. I have countless stories of friends who feel conflicting things one day or you know, the opposite the next. And, and so one of the things I realized was how difficult it was in a few sentences to explain. And another thing was how the pace of daily life when you're living through changes like that often doesn't allow you the opportunity to stop and reflect. Uh, living in Russia in the 90s, whereas one day Yeltsin might dissolve the parliament, on the other hand, you know, I had exams to study for or a job to get to, and, and people's lives go on. And whereas from far, when we're reading the headlines, we might think, oh my god, everyone's sitting there clutching their heads and you know, doesn't know what to do. In certain sectors of life, people are feeding their children breakfast and going about their daily lives. And so I think one thing that the film allowed for the five people in it is it gave them the opportunity for the first time in these last 20 years since all of these changes have happened to sit and stop and reflect about what really has this meant for them. It, it, it was interesting to watch them. You use their home movies mm -hmm. as a way to look back. Uh, and, 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 and yes, and give them the opportunity in the film to look and reflect. Um, there seemed to be mixed feelings about that past. Some, there was some romanticism and yet present um, confusion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, um, so after the experience of, of, of going through the film, what were, uh, what, is, what were some of the reactions of the subjects of the film? <laughs> 
They were all pleased with the film, uh, and especially uh, Bordi and Luba, the history teachers. And that was something I was very proud of because as historians, they they like the film. They think it's an important document for future generations to see, and and they've said that they're proud to be a part of it, which means a lot because I've spent you know five and a half years with all of them, following them, filming them, using their home movies, listening to their stories, getting to know all of them, but still, you know, that moment, they all have said they had no idea, you know, what the film would be like in the end, and, and it is a really important moment when they see it. And the home movies are, are really wonderful. It's, it's the kind of, kind of personal, everyday stuff of real human life that we certainly didn't see here growing up, you know, about life in the Soviet Union. I think the only things I ever saw were uh, me, I don't know, maybe soldiers marching in formation or people uh, standing in bread lines. And, and these are the, the stuff of the, what hu really humanizes it. It's children playing with their grandfather or learning to ride a bicycle and, and really does show that for all of the political shows or the propaganda or government animosity or what have you, there are human beings that live in both places. And that's one thing that that audience members after the theatrical run have come to say, that they really had no idea just you know, how much we have in common and how much we had in common even back then. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I guess today for culture there with the advertising and, and the consumerism that, that they're able to enjoy if, if, if they can afford it, what's... Um, they have even more in common. <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe more than they real <laughs> wanted. I mean, it, I don't know what the film is, if the film has a statement about that, but or if they have made up their minds. Well, but certainly you can see that, that the childhood that their children today are having is very different from their own childhood. They all grew up when the Soviet Union was really cut off from the rest of the world, you know, behind the Iron Curtain. And their kids today are global kids. They are watching South Park. They are listening to their iPods. And they're, they're very much plugged into the same media that kids all over the world are. You know, and that's for better or for worse. Uh, there, there's a moment in the film where um, some of the parents are complaining that their kids don't read anymore. But that, of course, isn't a function of you know, the Soviet Union or Russia. You can hear parents you know, in the US complaining about the fact that no one reads anymore. That's right. technology. Right. So, the film doesn't really try to answer the question of what happened when the system, the Soviet system, broke down. But it was a real question for the subjects in the film, sort of like, what happened to our lives? Well, it, well the film very much tries to show um, the perspective of each of the five mm. of them and how they, they all have very different stories and sometimes very different perspectives on the very same event. Uh, I, the, the five of them are the married couple of history teachers, a businessman who has a chain of expensive French men's dress shirts and ties all over the country, uh, a single mom who rents out billiard tables around the city, and, uh, and this uh, punk musician, Free Spirit, who now has a, a punk bluegrass band and plays sometimes in the subway and plays gigs all over. And the five of them really have different points of view and I, I think what the film allows is the audience to really get to know these people well. People have said it makes them feel as if they've been transported to Moscow to sit at someone's kitchen table and have tea with them and to really show some of the complexities and nuances. There, I, I think it's fair to say that not one of them wishes that the Soviet Union was was back today exactly as it was but certainly there are aspects of their childhood that they miss and one can miss you know, childhood without meaning that you're missing Brezhnev or you're missing, you know, the Communist Party. And there's certainly things today that they all celebrate and that there are things today that they wish would be a little bit different. But, you know, I think that's a also a pretty universal human experience. So, um, living through these dramatic changes, um, it have, it, is there uh, some kind of uh, organizing principle in their lives to make sense of the, the way things are today or are they living that through their children is there some how, how, how can they sort of psychologically come to a resolution to that this is how it's going to be for, for the <laughs> well you know I think during Brezhnev when all of them were little um, there was really a, a big separation between the public sphere and the private sphere the kind of the politics and the party all of that kind of existed in a separate plane from where people really found meaning in their life which was with their friends or literature or music uh, people have very rich rich personal lives and 
each individual made the decision for themselves how much or how little they wanted to be involved in the system. And under Gorbachev, I, I feel that those, those two planes of existence really converged for the first time, that ordinary citizens felt that there was a reason to be involved and, and marching on the street could actually do something and their voices could change something. And over the past 20 years, unfortunately, those two planes have again begun to diverge. And uh, you know, people really don't feel that there's much that they have any ability to change that they don't like. So again, I think each person is finding the meaning in their life and the satisfaction in life in the personal sphere. I think for Andre, it's very much you know building his business. Um, you know, for the mayor, since it's their students and teaching history, and their son, of course. I think very much also it is people living through their children, and also there, th people are going about their daily lives. Uh, I don't know you know how much opportunity in the kind of the pace of everyday life they want to sit and think about things, you know, how much they have time to or how much they want to. You know, Olga, for one, has said to me that if you think about, sometimes if you really sit and think about the state of the world, you get very sad. So maybe it's better to just read a novel, <laughs> get on with your day. Okay. Well, Robin, thank you for joining me. Thank you. I should say, though, for all of the gloom and doom, the film is uh, very funny as well. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's a charming <laughs> film, and, and, the, and, and you do capture their yes their struggle but also what w their life and, and I think that's wonderful to see so thank, thank you for you. bringing the film uh, My Perestroika airs on PBS check POV on the website for local listings